the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, the second gospel in the New Testament. So if you want to turn in your Bibles today and follow along, feel free. If you just want to listen, that'll be wonderful too. Mark chapter 3. And Jesus entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there with a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. Now, isn't that a bunch of hypocrites? Instead of enjoying the love in Jesus Christ, they're only looking to find a little piccadillo fault with him. And he saith unto the men which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, or to do evil, to save a life, or to kill? But they held their peace. What would you answer? You're in church on Sunday, and there's a, a poor young boy or young girl that's been crippled from birth. And they want to pray for him and heal him, and people stand up and say, No, you can't do that on on Sunday, on church day. And you say to yourself, really, you bunch of hypocrites? No, most certainly it is good to do good on Sunday or the Sabbath. But when he had looked around about them, on them with anger, being grieved for their hardness of hearts, he said unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole, as the other. And the Pharisees went forth straightway, took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Really? You want to destroy him because he healed somebody? That's hatred. That's hypocrisy. That is demonism. People hate you because you love Jesus Christ, my friend. That's the prince and the power of the air working in that person's life. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him. And from Judea, from Galilee and Judea, big multitude, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spoke to the disciples that a small ship should wait upon him because of the multitude that they should throng him. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. I'll tell you what, if I had a little child that was had a cancer or a palsy or a sickness or was crippled or whatever, I'd be trying to get close to Jesus and touch him with the child. Yeah, wouldn't you? I would. Verse 11. And unclean spirits, when, which when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. See, there's a different difference between confession of saying Jesus is the Son of God and there's a difference between taking it to the belief of, yes, I want Jesus as the Son of God in my life. The demons believe that he's the Son of God, but it doesn't do him no good because they, they have not repentance in their life. But when you know, you know Jesus is the Son of God. And you're willing to let him have control of your life. And you receive him. That is a belief and a confession that will last through eternity. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ is simple, it's clean, but it must be done. Every man, woman, and child upon this great earth must make that decision to call upon Jesus. So the demons cried out, you're the son of God. And he warned them, said, don't tell them that. They need to figure it out for themselves. 
They need to seek, ask, and knock for themselves. And he goeth up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained the twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, to have power, to heal, to cast out devils. And here's the list. Gave them the power. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They cast out devils. They healed the sick, the dead, the lame. And even with all that, there was still a stinker in the midst, Judas. With all, after all of that, tasted of the heavenly gift, had all those wonderful things, but like Hebrews said, around about chapter 6, tasted of the heavenly gift, and yet bore forth brambles, pricker bushes. And yet, they continued on. So he anointed them with power of the Holy Spirit, and now he chose them. Simon, whom he surnamed Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which means the sons of thunder. A lot of songs have been sung about that, but they don't, the song, I don't, they don't really make it quite clear of who the thunder is. Because most certainly James and John were the sons of Jesus Christ. And they were wild. But they loved Jesus. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus and Simeon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went to a house. And the multitude came together again so that they could not even eat such as their meal. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, He is beside himself. No, but sometimes we have to set aside the meal table and the feast and minister, do our job, make it through a difficult situation. Jesus and the disciples had the greatest ministry upon the earth. And most certainly, as Jesus is the architect of the universe, our souls unto eternal life. And the church, which has gone on through countless persecutions. And one day, we will stand before him in heaven giving him a big wave offering of praise and adoration, for he is worthy. Verse 22, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub by the prince of the devils, casteth he out the devils. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against that itself, that house cannot stand. That's that's kind of a truth. If a home is divided, the family is divided. What that family can accomplish is crippled because of the division. And if there's non believers in a believing family and there's a constant war going on in the background, yeah, that, that family's what they can fulfill as a family, is crippled because of that war, because of Satan, because there's a division, because of those that are non-believers trying to mingle with believers. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter in a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost never has forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. 
Once again, another great example of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. These Sadducees and Pharisees believed, they knew Jesus had an anointing from God in heaven, but they hated him because it meant that all mankind had to be on an equal plane, and they loved declaring their sovereignty over other people, claiming they were great. They chose rather for the short time of glory here on earth than to spend eternity with the Lord, their Savior who was walking amongst them, and they hated him because of it. Truly, that is another great and fine example of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Hating a righteous man just because you hate him. Hating the Holy Spirit that's in a righteous man because you see him working for God and you're jealous of him and you hate him. They are in danger of eternal damnation that commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The epistle of John says you're not even to pray for such people. They're reprobates. Jesus never once prayed for the Pharisees and Sadducees. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus, knowing that Judas was a devil, a demon, possessed by a demon, never didn't say, come on, Judas, get out of this. He let him make his own choices because life's about choices. The Bible says, pray for your enemies. Talking about those in your body, in your brethrenhood, who are in Christ, but they have little picadillos against you. And God may or may not change them, but praying for them, their little picadillos, kind of gives you the release. Say, yeah, it's your choice. You can believe or not believe that. You know, you know what whatever your little thing is, and they say, no, no, I don't believe that. Pray for them. They're, they've kind of pitted themselves as an enemy against you. But if you have somebody coming up against you with fists and clubs and pull a knife on you, you defend yourself. You don't pray for them. You defeat them. You smash. That's why Jesus and the disciples carried swords. Verse 31. There came then his brethren and mother, and standing outside, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother, my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother 